Hello everyone, welcome back to another episode of The Casual Martial Artist with Al and Marcus. So today's uh, topic, we're going to be talking about training, uh, specifically some types of training equipment. We're also going to get into some like physical training like the like uh, weightlifting, strength training, and aerobic, uh, aerobic training as well. So this is going to, in a way, this is going to kind of piggyback off of the, our last episode about the cardio martial arts craze, because of course, what's one of the biggest new year's resolutions people make this time of year, <laughs> everyone wants to get in better shape. So, right. so hopefully uh, you'll find some of the information that uh, we present today to be useful or helpful. And we're also going to talk a little bit, again, we mentioned in, when we did our episode on the aerobic martial arts craze how we took that active lifestyle in class back in college. So we're going to try to recall some of the information from that, which I don't know. It's a little fuzzy for me at this point. What about you? Me too. I've tried my best to forget it over the years. <laughs> oh, it wasn't that bad of an experience, was it? Uh, no, 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 no. <laughs> yeah. Cause I mean, it's been for me, it's been about 20 years. So yeah, I guess like I said, you kind of understand our, the memory's a little fuzzy. So Anyways, so to start this off, uh, Marcus, you wanted to discuss some of the types of training equipment more for the martial aspect of it. Right. Um, I concentrate mine on kicking and punching, you know, the stand-up martial arts. Just to give up the rundown of some equipment of what I think people should be using or could be using. Um, Muay Thai pads. I'm sure you've seen these at the Thai Fighters train on. Um and along with that, the chest protector or belly protector that they wear. There is also a suitcase pad that has one handle that you put in front of your leg and have uh, the person you're training with kick at it. Focus mitts, which you're familiar from boxing and Muay Thai and other striking arts. There's a punch pad they use mostly in boxing, but I've seen kickboxers use it too. Um, it's got, it's round, has two handles, one on each side, and you hold it at different angles to let uh, the guy you're training or woman you're training whatever the case may be, non-binary person, whatever, punch at it from different angles. Heavy bag, of course, for punching power and combinations. Double end bag, one of the my favorite pieces of equipment for your timing, speed, reflexes, and combinations. Speed bag for a speed, of course, timing and reflexes. Uh, medicine ball and for abs and plyos. And jump rope. Okay, some of that stuff I remember, because I know I have done the focus mitts, I think my Screma instructor had some of those. So I remember mm -hmm. uh, that was primarily because I the, the basic drill we usually did, it's like, you know, you want to hold them together. Mm -hmm. And that's supposed to represent, okay, that's when your opponent is guarding. And then you open them and you might put like one high and one low. And that's supposed to represent openings. And then you're supposed to go at those. And I know, I mean, I know they're not focus mitts, but I there's... They're like the smaller pads where, again, you, you have the strap on the back and then there's like a little uh, loop that you grab at the top. Personally, I think I like the focus mitts a little better. They just feel a little more comfortable than those. You know what I'm talking about, right? The small right. square ones. Yep. And now they've got them curved too, so within the last 15 years. So that makes it even more comfortable to use. Okay, because, yeah, I know. I just remember when I used to teach uh, Kung Fu at our one of our local YMCA's, I guess they had like a, a cardio kickboxing class that they did there. So every now and then I would use those, um, I would use those little square pads. And I just remember them, like I said, being uncomfortable to hold. But right. I, I think the kids really that I was teaching really liked the drill because I, I think it made them feel like they were applying some of the stuff that I was teaching them. Right. Um, I wish every cardio kickboxing program would add some, to some pad training or something like that because people get so much out of it and it works your cardio 10 times more, I think, than just punching in the air. Yeah, and I also like – one of the other things I like about it is I think it really helps improve your reaction because, mm -hmm. again, you're, you you see the person, you know, they're holding the, the pads closed – so, you know, okay, right. it's not the time to attack yet. And it's kind of like, okay, where are they going to, you know, what are they going to do? Are they going to have both high? Are they going to have one high, one low, both low? And then from there, it's kind of like, okay, how am I going to attack those, you know, what's supposed to be those opening spots? Right. 
and traditionists will complain and uh, like I focus on certain routines both when I use them um, training my own skills and when I trained other people and there's people who argue well that's just you know you're making people memorize patterns well I, if you switch up the routine you don't have to memorize patterns you know you can make your whoever it is you're training uh, make it to where they don't get to you you know get used to one look you can change it up a bit so they have different angles and different attacks to defend from exactly and what we would what i would do sometimes when i was doing that drill and i don't know if you've done this or if anyone you've worked out has done this sometimes not only you know would it hold the one of the pads out it represent an opening but also mm -hmm. would take like a hook with uh, one of the pads because you know you're not doing it fast but you've got that padding there so I right. thought that was always a good thing because then it simulates that again you're getting the person in the mindset that okay you got to be ready to look for those openings right but also sometimes someone's going to try to come in with a you know a shot at you right and I mean I when I did that I didn't go too soft all the time you know give them a good smack <laughs> to, you know Give them something legitimate, not, you know, you don't want to wail on them. Just give them a little medium-sized swing to, for them to duck or put their hands up to make sure, keep them honest while they're training. You know, whenever I worked with someone, they would learn to expect that from me, so it wasn't a surprise. It wasn't like I was being a D-bag or anything, trying to hurt them or trying to go for them. But, you know, I wanted someone to have that awareness and readiness to keep their guard up or to be ready to use some movement and get out of the way. Yeah, because the, the YMCA I taught at was a bit smaller so mm -hmm. there wasn't really a lot of space. There was, I think, like a uh, multi-purpose activity room, but the room that I taught in was the dance studio. And right. they only really had room in their curriculum for a class for like six to, I think like six to eight, and then the other second group was like nine to 12. So I was part of the youth sports curriculum. Uh, unfortunately, they never had a chance to, I never had a chance to get an adult program. So again, you right. got to, yeah, a lot of the kids I was working with were 12 and under. So like I said, I couldn't go full force because right. uh, again, I didn't want to, of course, didn't want to hurt them. Right. So the other one, I, cause I know I have used the bigger pads. Um, cause my Kung Nu instructor, uh, she has some of those pads as well. The, the big ones that we use when we're doing the sidekicks and knees. And then sometimes when we're practicing the kicking drills, you know, she'll have the, like I said, the square pads, the the uncomfortable, right. the hold ones. So, again, mostly to focus on, you know, hitting the target. So I've always thought that was really helpful because, and I think you mentioned this too, it gives you a lit, it gives you something to focus on other than kicking or punching in the air. But right. the other thing I think it's important, it does give you a little bit of that tactile feedback. So mm -hmm. you know you know how your body's going to feel when you punch or kick something. Impact, right. And I think that's especially important when uh, you're talking about kicks like front snap kick and then some versions of roundhouse kicks where you have uh, the – anything where you've got like your toes bent back and you're hitting with – okay, is it – what's it called? The part that's right under your toes. The, that's not the ball of the foot, is it? Or is that mm – -hmm. that is a ball of the foot, isn't it? Right, it is. Yeah, because I'm – yeah, something like that. <laughs> if, right. if we're wrong, uh, you know – Please feel free to send drop us a line, but um, yeah, just right. for those kicks, whenever you have your your toes curled back, I think that that's where it's really beneficial to have those pads, so that way you know that you're having your toes curled back far enough where when you do make contact, you're not, you know, you're not hurting your toes. Right, and like you said, um, it's training, so you don't want to hurt anyone. You don't want them to hurt themselves because then they can't train. Yeah, that's true, because uh, I remember you were saying a couple episodes back, you were talking about uh, Muay Thai and how, mm -hmm. you know, even though they do all this, you know, these really hardcore, you know, fight matches, you said that they really don't go full contact in training very often. So, At least not in sparring. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So when you were, because you did some Muay Thai, so was it more like just uh, mostly like bag work and speed work, or did you just like light contact sparring? Uh, we did like high-tech sparring if we sparred at all. It wasn't Muay Thai. It was either um, boxing or what's called Sanshu rules or Sanda rules, where you know, kickboxing with takedowns. Okay. Um, otherwise, you know, if you just go full-on Muay Thai, then you, someone's going to get hurt. 
especially when, you know, some of the blocks you do with your shins. So you're going to hurt somebody or someone's going to get hurt even with pads on. So you don't want to do that because they're your, tr your training partner or yourself gets hurt and has to sit out a couple of weeks. So you're out that training partner. Otherwise, yeah, mostly, mostly pad work. Yeah. And, and yeah, definitely the amount of force you use when sparring, it has to be, you really have to be careful with that. Because mm -hmm. I, when I was just browsing through you videos on YouTube uh, not too long ago, I remember seeing, it was a video about Gracie Jiu Jitsu and the title was called Trust the Tap because they right. were, I guess there was a video going around where they had a white belt uh, sparring against a more experienced student. I think the guy, I don't know if he was a black belt or if it was just a higher rank, but right. the, you know, of course the more experienced guy got the, you know, the white belt and I'm wanting to say it was a rear naked choke. Right. I'm not exact. I, I said, I don't, I don't remember the exact choke he got him in, but you know, the guy was, the white belt was sitting there tapping like crazy and you know, he wasn't letting him go. Wow. And then, you know, eventually he, you know, he let go and they had to, you know, kind of slap the guy a little bit to get him because I guess he had passed out. Right. And, uh, you know, then when they start going again, they're like, they're, I don't, and the guys who were commentating, um, you know, again, this is why they're saying we trust the tap because, you know, that's a good way to not only possibly hurt someone, but also lose students for your school. I mean, right. I, if. I mean, and again, you have more uh, experience with the, the grappling than I do, but I mean, I don't know about you, but if I was in a, trying to learn a martial art and, you know, they were constantly choking me until I passed out, I probably wouldn't stay at that school very long. Right. The second person I trained with pulled some crap on me like that. He, he did a windpipe choke when he didn't have to. And that was the last time I ever, you know, I'm, I'm paying this guy, so no way am I going to do that. But what you're describing to me is actually surprising because I've never experienced somebody of rank um, – blue belt as a second rank, and I've never seen someone who, uh, you know, who's been a blue belt for a while or up above not respond to a tap out, not let go after a tap out. I've never seen that happen. That's that's pretty bad. Yeah, and it's – like I said, and these guys were – I mean, I don't remember if they were part of the Gracie family or mm -hmm. if they were just uh, you know people who taught – uh, the the Gracie system but yeah it's like and one of the things they were mentioning is and this is one of the things I did like about grappling right. is you know you can go all out and as long as you're trusting that tap and letting the person out of the hold when they they've had enough you know okay like let's say we were to grapple you know okay we get down there we start rolling and five seconds later when you get me to tap out you know okay we pick ourselves off we dust ourselves off and you know we're we're good to go where that's one of the advantages I think grapple training and grappling has over the striking because I mean, you, I think it's probably a lot easier. I'm guessing it's probably a lot easier to hurt someone if you're going full force punches and kicks than, you know, grappling. Also, I wonder if there were extenuating circumstances because sometimes I don't know if this happens anymore, but they used to have people show up to jujitsu schools and do challenge matches. And sometimes a guy mm -hmm. would, um, crank on and not not let go after a tap of that because the guy person would usually come in and be really disrespectful and you know they i guess kind of teach him a lesson but i would like to know this extenuating circumstances behind why that guy didn't let go because that's see, like you said from a, from a marketing standpoint alone that's pretty bad yeah i'll make i'll try to see if i can after we're done recording i'll see if i can uh find that that video and i'll send you a link to it if you want to take a look at it but yeah that is true because I mean, I know that the the Gracie they did do the the Gracie challenge, but I mean that's something that isn't they more. It's not like someone just coming into one of their dojos and going, "Hey, I'll throw down." It's isn't something more like they just say, "Hey, I'm interested in trying it out," and then they arrange a match. It's not really spontaneous. No, it used to be like that. Or 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 they'd organize a fight and everyone would get together at a certain location. But yeah, it used to be actually like that. Someone come in. Say that, you know, they want to go and they'd go. Yeah, and, and I'm not sure if this is true or just like, ur, you know, martial arts urban legend, but because mm -hmm. uh, the other, other than Gracie Jiu Jitsu, probably the most well known of the Brazilian martial arts, Copiera. And I guess that's one of the reasons where they, I've, I've heard anyway, that's one of the 
the that was like the roots of the Gracie Challenge, where the members of the Gracie family they'd go to where you know the beach where these uh, Copiera guys are working out, and they would challenge them to fights, and mm-hmm. you know then eventually BJJ became kind of the the predominant martial art in in Brazil as opposed to the right. you know the the, the Copiera, mm-hmm. yeah. Okay, so then now, how much uh, experience have you had with like the the heavy bags and the speed bags? Because I may have worked out with them like once or twice, but it's not something I've had a lot of experience working with. On and off, from the time I was I would say thirteen until I want to say thirty five, because that's when kind of my body started breaking down and I wasn't healing well or healing as quickly. But yeah, I trained on and off, but pretty regularly when I did train. Yeah, because the now the speed bag you said that's more for like combinations, so or just to develop timing or right timing. And I never really did much of that because that tends to be, um, I don't know, people tend to just because they can do it, they tend to overestimate what their skills level is. You know, it's fun and it's a good way to cool down from a workout, but I never really took it seriously. Um, and I was one. <clears throat> especially when I was in my boxing club, I was one of the better ones who could do it. And I still didn't really take it seriously. It was just something fun to do after you were relaxing your shoulders from the heavy bag. Okay. So, okay. So yeah, more of a cool down. So, mm-hmm. cause like I said, I don't, um, I mean, maybe if I did try like a speed bag, it was just more like what you see with people doing the, you know, the rolling right. punches. So it's right. more like, okay, how many times can I hit this bag in 30 seconds? I didn't right. really, I mean, I didn't really know enough about it to do it anything beyond that. I didn't know it could be used as a cool down, though. I mean, that's how I used it. I don't know if anyone else would disagree or whatnot, but I always like to get all my energy out on either the heavy bag, the double end bag, or I've got, by that time, I'd already done my pad work also and, and or the sparring if I sparring was involved that day. So that was just something fun to relax with. It was meditative for me. Okay. And sparring gear you mentioned is another one where uh, I don't think I've ever really used the chest protectors. I, cause I don't think any of the places where I've studied martial arts had them. So, right. I mean, I know we usually just use like the foam gloves and right. we usually, we would do the, the head, the head guards as well. Mm-hmm. No, uh, the only way everywhere I've been to, the only reason to have the chest guard or the belly protector was for Muay Thai pad work. It's like if you were holding the pads for someone, that's what you'd be wearing also. Otherwise, you wouldn't wear those for sparring, no. I mean, and, none of the places I've been to. And uh, what do you have a preference for what type of sparring gloves that you usually like? Boxing gloves. Okay. Because what, mm-hmm. what I always liked, and I, I, I don't remember if we just were talking about this and I mentioned them or if I mentioned it in one of our previous uh, episodes, but they were the – and. I'm, I fortunately I can't find my pair, but it was mostly just the cut. It wasn't like wrap around like your normal karate sparring gear is or like the boxing gloves, but mm. the padded part covered mostly just the knuckles. And then it right. had the padding on the back of the hand and then it went down to the forearm. So I always liked that when I was training in college because, and again, I'm sure I mentioned this before, one of the guys that I worked out with, he, uh, was a black belt in Taekwondo, but he also had a background in wrestling. So whenever right. we would free spar, I kind of had to learn how to try to be prepared for both punches, kicks, and grappling, which right. I felt, which I think is really beneficial. But uh, he actually introduced me to this type of gear, and I so I ended up getting him. But it was nice because, like I said, it gave you that protection for the punching, but since it left your hands more open it also made it easier to try to grapple as well. Right. Yeah, I can see where that would work, yeah. And then we, there was also another one where for the foot where it covered just like the ins, the the top part of the foot, it didn't go all the way around the foot like your, like I said, like most of your karate gear does, but it also right. went up the shin, which again was also nice because that way you could do your shin strikes as well. Right, I love those pads. I used to own a pair a long time ago. They yeah, were awesome for training. Oh yeah, they're nice. Like I said, especially when you, as like I said, with how you have the background in, in the the kickboxing. So right. If you go back and watch, I don't know if you have yet or you're going to before we do the wrestling martial arts thing. See those um, Japanese pancreas matches that I sent you. 
I yeah, I, yeah. I watched a couple of them. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, a lot of those guys would wear those. Yeah, so that's a I know that's a topic we're going to be talking about, which I think it's going to be a fun episode because, um, you know, the, the connection between martial arts and wrestling actually went back a lot further than I thought it did. So we're going to, like mm-hmm. I said, we're, we'll be discussing that in a future episode, uh, it, probably sometime next month. But right. so, OK, we've got your focus mitts. Uh, the you mentioned the the training, like the the speed bags, the heavy bags. So of the types of pads and stuff that you've mentioned, what do you think would probably be the most essential ones? So if you're on a budget, which ones would you recommend? The Muay Thai pads and the belly protector. Because you can do the punches and kicks on those, whereas the focus mitts, you can only do punches. Mm-hmm. But if, you know, if you're on a really tight budget, then you probably can only get the focus mitts. So it's better than nothing. That's when I was just boxing. That's what that's what I used to train with. Yeah. Now, there's another piece of training equipment, which I, it's one of those things that you can make on your own. Mm-hmm. I don't remember the name of it. One of the places I studied at had one. Uh, the And actually, uh, there is one at the place I do, Kung Nu. What they usually do is like you take a, a two by four or, or not necessarily two by four, but a, a board of wood and you mount it against the wall and then you wrap a belt around it. And I think you put a little bit of padding, a very, very mm-hmm. little bit of padding under the belt. So what you're supposed to do is, I guess, punch it as hard as you possibly can and you do a few reps of that and then you, you know, you wait a few days before you do it again. And the right. way it was explained to me by someone I used to do Kung Fu with is it's when you do that, it's developing micro fractures in your, your, your knuckles and your, your bones. Right. And then, you know, you, you give it a you don't do it every day because you give it a few days and then those fractures start to heal up. But when right. they heal up, they get a little bit thicker than what they were before. So that's right. one of the ways that, you know, that you can harden your knuckles. And I think people who do like the professional breaking, I mean, I don't know if you've ever seen it on like That's Incredible or any other TV show, but people who do stuff like breaking blocks of ice, uh, they'll do stuff like that as well because, again, it toughens it toughens their body so they can uh, do these breaks without with right. less injury to themselves. If I'm not mistaken, I believe you're, what you're talking about is called a makiwara. Okay, yeah, that it, sounds familiar. It's origins in so. Okinawan karate. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. I was always too scared to, that I would eventually get arthritis when I was old after punching those things for too long. That's why I never <laughs> mess with equipment like that. Yeah, and one of the other types of training equipment I've seen, I've never actually used, but the Wing Chun mm-hmm. dummies. And mm-hmm. again, the Mook Chun. I tried that uh, once. Okay, so what exactly is the purpose of those? Because it's basically like a pose. It, it has like uh, dowels sticking out of it, or it has right. like other pieces extending out of it. So. What's the purpose of those anyway? I believe the theory is a practice trapping. Okay. Like I said, I only used it a couple of times, and, and that was just for fun when I was trying to teach myself Wing Chun type forms, you know, back when I was following Bruce Lee's path. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I believe that's the theory behind it. Okay. Mm-hmm. So those are some of the different types of martial arts training equipment we've uh, used and had experience with. So now we're going to mm-hmm. move into the next part because... I mean, all just training equipment by itself is only part of it Uh, because, you know, you can do all your kicks and your forms and stuff like that. But Mm -hmm. really, if you want to be a really effective martial artist, you also got to do your strength training and your cardio conditioning as well. So this is the part where, again, our memories might be a little rusty because, like I said, that that uh, active lifestyle class we took in college was about 20 years or, or more ago. So but. The main thing I remember from the strength training, uh, because, again, I did take, we touched on it in Active Lifestyle, but as I mentioned in our last episode, I also had that class strength training and conditioning. So when you're starting a strength training program, the most important thing is you always got to make sure you're keeping good form. Uh, You want to make sure that you're not, uh, again, keeping your back straight and you always got to make sure you're not like moving your torso, especially if you're doing like curls, that you're not like, right. you know, moving back and forth because not only do you risk, uh, you know, hurting your back, but you're also not getting the full benefit from the exercise. Right. Now, when lifting weights, did you ever really use a belt or was that something that you just never really uh, got into? 
I didn't get, I never got into it really seriously. I never used develop. So, um, I know I did go to the Y a few times, but like I said, that was never really my thing. And I don't, I never took it as seriously as I should have. It wasn't something that was a huge part of my, even when I was trying to get into MMA, it wasn't a huge part of my regimen. You know, it should have been, but it never really got to be. Yeah. And, and I've, from what I've heard, there's a, a bit of a divide as to whether you actually need a belt or not. Mm -hmm. Cause I remember at one gym I used to go to, there was a, occasionally they would, they had a bulletin board where they would just post articles and right. one of them I remember was about, you know, weightlifting belts. Are they necessary? And the uh, article, because I remember reading it once when I was just kind of like cooling down, it said that while there, there's actually benefits to training with and without a belt, because there was a study where they had a control group where they had two, two groups of, of people with the approximate level of, of experience and strength. One group used belts and the others didn't. And both groups mm -hmm. did gain, you know, did make improvements and gains, but they found that the people who weren't using the belt actually uh, gained strength in their lower back that the people using the belts didn't. Right. So I guess the way I would, I, my personal opinion would be if, if you're not really familiar with weightlifting, then you probably want to use it when you're a bit more experienced and you know your limits and you know proper form then you can probably uh, get by without it. And I was also told that ideally you should have, the, you know, be working your abs outside of weightlifting and that should be, you know, your support system instead of a belt. Okay. And also when you are doing weight training, it's always, you don't want to lift the same group. You don't want to use the same group of muscles every day. Because I remember when I, my freshman year in college, uh, I got a membership for the, the student health center in the basement of the, the hall that I was living in that year. Mm -hmm. And one of the things they had there is they had, they printed out a sheet where you could put your date and you could, you know, list, lift how you could list how much you were lifting. And one of the, uh, I did like arms two days in a row. And right. that's one of the, the, the guys there corrected me. It's like, okay, you probably shouldn't do that. And he explained that you want to all generally you want to alternate, you don't want to do uh, the it two days in a row because after you exercise, what it's doing is putting stress on your muscles. And you need at least 48 hours to heal. So mm -hmm. generally, if you're going to be doing arms, you know, you want to do arms, then legs, then arms and legs. So you want to, so by giving your body that chance to heal, it what it'll do is it uh, help, it gives a muscle more time to recover properly. Okay. Now, another thing you always have to watch out for when you're doing both aerobic conditioning and strength training is you have to watch out for what's called a plateau. And this usually occurs when you're doing a very set routine. And the reason it's called a plateau is, okay, let's say that you've done it for a couple of weeks. You're noticing that, you know, you're able to lift more, you're able to go further, but then it gets to a point where, you know, it, it just kind of evens out. So maybe you're able to bench 150 pounds, but, and then you work your way up to 155 and then you just can't, you just keep doing that same routine. And that's all you ever do. Again, you reach that plateau and usually right. it's because you're not seeing those gains because you're, you're not doing, you're not encountering enough resistance. So some things I looked for, uh, this is from a site bodybuilding.com. And what I'm going to focus on is, okay, I am not a professional bodybuilder, <laughs> definitely, uh, just looking at the weight I've gained recently, but we're not going to go there right now. <laughs> right, right. Uh, so what I'm focusing on is this is just uh, for general health and fitness. So this is for, this is advice they give for people who want to get stronger, but they're not look they're not looking to bulk up. So you don't want to, you're not trying to look like Arnold Schwarzenegger in his prime or Brock Lesnar, you know, anything like that. You just want to get stronger. So generally what you want to do is eight to 12 reps perform to fatigue. And usually you want to do any one to two sets. Uh, you want to rest about 30 to 90 seconds between sets and then one to two minutes between each exercise. So again, you're doing your, let's say you do your bicep curls, do 
eight to 12 of those to fatigue, whatever, uh, you know, however, uh, amount of weight you can do. And mm -hmm. then if you're going to do two sets, give yourself, you know, said 30 seconds to a minute and a half to rest. And then once you're done with those sets, then you want to give yourself a couple minutes before you, let's say, move to triceps. Now, once you've gotten more advanced, you can do pyramid sets. And there's three different types. First are ascending. This is where you start light and then get progressively heavier. Descending, which is uh, when you start heavy and then get progressively lighter. And then the final one is triangles. So this is where you start light, get heavier, and then get lighter. So when you were doing more weightlifting, uh, what would you usually do? Did you generally do like pyramid sets or did you, uh, did you just do like maybe one or two sets and that was it? One or two sets and that's it? Yeah, because generally when I was start doing weightlifting again, and again, I'm hoping to get back into it this month because uh, I mentioned a thing I mentioned a couple episodes back that I'm, my knee was was uh, messed up and then my started to have problems with my neck. So now that that's just about done, <laughs> hoping to start getting active again. But usually I always do a set of three. And I found out that worked fairly well for me where I would usually do a set of eight, a set of 12, and then go back to a set of eight, where again, go start light, get heavy, and then get light. And I, uh, I think when I was in college, I would do five sets. So I would do like a set of like, I think like eight, 10, 12, 10, and then eight. Wow. So again, this is just very basic information. So I would recommend taking a look at, uh, you know, bodybuilding.com, or if you have the money and the opportunity, definitely recommend joining a YMCA or a, a or a fitness club because the people there are going to know what they're, well, in theory, anyway, they should know what they're doing. So they're going to, they can give you, uh, you know, they can give you advice on how to lift correctly and what programs you might want to try. Now, since we are focusing though on, you know, what if you've got a budget? What if you want to do some strength training, but you don't really have the money or the inclination to join a gym? Do you have two options? First are resistance bands, which have the advantage of being inexpensive. Uh, they take up very little space. You can take them with you. So again, if you're going on vacation and you don't want to, you know, you don't, you don't. You... So if you're going on vacation and you don't want to miss your workout, it's not that hard to throw them in your your uh, backpack or your uh, or your duffel bag or whatever. And you can also work most muscle groups with them. They're safer than free weights, so they're also good for beginners. The main disadvantage with resistance bands is you're probably not going to get totally ripped using these unless you're using a set with very high resistance, but they can be very helpful for tone and strengthening. So have you ever used resistance bands? A couple of times. Um, I had this bizarro body by Jake machine when I first <laughs> uh, got out of high school and uh, it was, it was fun. It was just, it, you know, got me moving. And then we used to do something in boxing, um, forget what they're called now wall pulleys kind okay, of the yes. same yeah the same um concept so yeah i tried it, it wasn't bad yeah because i've seen the one that we have i don't know how much weight it gives but we used to have this like it was one that was kind of like a short jump rope you know it had the handles and then the elastic band but there was like a, a little string or there was like a, a rope with a like a rubber ball that you would put in the center of it and then what right. you would do is you would put that in a door and that would let you simulate like a, you know, a bench press if you're putting it at about chest height or if you put it at the bottom, you know, you can do like the rowing. Mm -hmm. So I personally, though, I prefer dumbbells opposed to the, as opposed to the resistance bands. Now, these I think will give you a little bit better workout. Uh, they are a bit more expensive, though, and do take up a bit more room. Generally, they're about a dollar per pound. Uh, so again, usually, uh, in general, a 20 pound dumbbell is going to run you about $20, give or take. Now, if you have the money, but again, these are expensive. Now, have you ever seen the, they call them dial weights? I have not. What they are, it's, they don't take up too much space, uh, because I, ideally 
you want to get the dumbbells that will let you add weight because again that'll mm -hmm. let you do your pyramid sets and uh, I think overall that's supposed to be a little bit better for uh, if you're trying to build strength as opposed to just tone and you know get in a little bit better shape but what the dial weights are it's a barbell and then it's got a dial well you put the you put the handle in this little rack that has plates you turn the dial to whatever weight you want and then there it triggers some mechanism where when you pull it out it only takes the it only takes the weight that you want uh, when I was doing a little research, I know Bowflex makes one that goes anywhere from about two pounds to 52 pounds. Mm -hmm. But like I said, they are expensive. They can usually run anywhere from about three to four hundred dollars. So wow. yeah, it's it's an investment. But I don't know. Maybe after I get my tax refund, we'll look into getting one of those because it actually seems like it'd be a really it'd be really helpful. Because I mean, I do have a bench press in my basement, and I do have the mm -hmm. you know the barbells, but you know, we have the one where you put the plates on and then there's like a little screw device you got to do to, to keep them in place. So, right. Do you have any experience with kettlebells? I do not. I've seen them, but I've never actually used them. Yeah. Neither have I. I've always wanted to try those and the, the clubs that you can swing. Okay, that, I, I know that's a more old timey kind of exercise, but yeah, I haven't seen weighted clubs, but that would be interesting. So, yeah, because right. I, I know kettlebells were a bit of a fad for a while. I'm not sure if they're right. still really popular, but right. yeah, I, unfortunately, I don't have any experience with them, so I can't really speak to their effectiveness. Okay. So, next we go to aerobic training. So, usually this you want to do about three to four times a week, and last I heard, the current S, the current suggestion is you want to try to get in at least 150 minutes of cardiovascular activity per week. And like with any exercise program, you generally want to start slowly and then work your way up. Now, and I don't, I don't know how much you remember back from the uh, active lifestyle class, but I know they were in there, they were talking about how much you had to do to be effective. Mm -hmm. Now, as I recall, it was, you had to, in order to get some benefit, you have to be between 55 to 70 percent of your max heart rate and you have to do it for at least 15 minutes if you want to improve then you have to do anywhere from 75 to 80 percent your max heart rate but from what i understand I, I recall it's like anything above 85 to 90 percent is not necessary because i think they were saying that yeah you'll gain a little bit of benefit but it's not it's negligible so mm -hmm. you're better off uh, staying below that rate because you're less likely to accidentally, you know, hurt yourself or overwork yourself. Right. So now when we were back in that class, one of the things I remember, uh, remember when I had to do the, uh, we had to make our own exercise plan and we had to keep those records. Yep. So I don't know. Did you find that helpful or did you think it was just kind of a waste of time? It was a waste of time in my opinion. <laughs> um, yeah, and it's funny I say that because I'm one of those people who loves making lists about everything. I could just make lists all day, and I even found that a waste of time. I mean, first of all, they were never clear on what they wanted, you know, exactly what they wanted us to get down there. And you could lie, you know, your butt off about anything yeah. that you're doing. And second of all, it, it, they never explained to us, you know, the philosophy by it, you know, like how to organize it in a more, you know, a better uh, the best way to organize it so where it would be helpful for us yeah because i personally honestly i personally found it helpful mm -hmm. uh because what i would do because i remember like especially because in this class they focused mostly on the cardio right and i i because rem i remember there was this route i used to go jogging on mm -hmm. and i would find you know just looking at the time it's like i found out you know just by keeping those records I would see a little bit of improvement and also what I would do to measure how well I was doing. It's like, okay, you know, maybe like last week I was passing a certain, you know, building about 10 minutes into my jog, but then I noticed later I was passing it maybe eight minutes into my jog. So I knew that, okay, I was getting a little bit faster and I was always able to go a little bit further. Right. So, I mean, I don't think it's, if you're just doing it casually, I don't think it's necessary to, 
I don't think it's necessary to keep exact notes, but if you are trying to really, you know, do a serious program, I think it's usually a good idea, but. Right. It sounded like that was useful if you had certain goals. Yeah. But at that time, I didn't have any goals, so. <laughs> yeah, and that's another thing I remember they were mentioning, and this is, again, very important for when you are developing an exercise program is you want to always, you do want to set goals, but you always want to make sure you're setting realistic and measurable mm -hmm. goals. Right. Um, so, for example, just saying that I want to jog three times a week isn't really necessarily a good plan because, well, anyone can, okay, let's say you go out and you jog for one, two minutes three times a week. Yeah, you're out jogging three times a week, but you're not really you know, it's not really going to be enough to get any benefit out of it. Right. So, well, any final thoughts about training and some of the equipment that we, you can use for training? Just one last thing about the heavy bag. Uh, don't do too much of it because you'll ruin your shoulders. Uh, the old timers used to tell me about that and I blew them off and sure enough, did it when I was 35. <laughs> hmm. So why does it, what, what, how does it ruin your shoulders just because of the, um, it, Impact to... basically. Okay. Mm -hmm. I tore a lot of cartilage in my rotator cuffs, and my rotator cuffs were never the same. So it's kind of a two-edged sword. Where yeah, it's nice to get that, you know, that feedback, but then you don't want to overdo it. Right. You should be at, at the very most three fourths of your power. Ideally, one half, I think. But you know, my ego at the time didn't let me do that, so I paid the price. Yeah, and I guess it's also, of course, the bag is just going to sit there no matter how hard you hit it, where, you know, you walk, if you're fighting someone, you give them a really good, you know, good, strong hook, they're going to, of course, well, most likely they're going to stumble back a bit, so there's exactly. a little bit of give there, so. Well, we hope that you found this information helpful, and I'd like to thank you all for listening, and uh, just remember to keep the, keep on training and keep those kicks above the belt and below the face. Check out the guys over at Eclectic Media Project. They bring you podcasts such as Musically Challenged. Whose podcast is it anyway? Want to hear something interesting? And their newest podcast, page 3.14 News. Check them out on Podbean and iTunes at Eclectic Media Project. On their website at www.eclecticmediaproject.com. Check them out as they are the home with a little something for almost everyone. have been listening to a program from the Point of Insanity Network. Visit us at poigamestudio.podbean.com for more shows. Follow us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter at POI Game Studio.